Tonight, how you can change your brain and how the discovery of the brain's amazing ability to rewire itself is giving researchers new hope for treating disease and for improving life as we age. It's called neuroplasticity. Simply put, it's the brain's never-ending ability to change. They are the keepers of the ancient but still evolving practice of Tibetan Buddhism. They begin as small children, memorizing and training their minds for a lifetime of devotion. Looking inward becomes a way of life, and meditation is one tool in their quest for enlightenment. And now this 2,500-year-old practice is offering modern neuroscience a path to understanding how our brains can change throughout life. It's a phenomenon called neuroplasticity and it's turned brain science on its head. So the first thing I'm going to do is measure your head. 33-year-old Yangay Mengar Rinpoche, an esteemed teacher of Tibetan Buddhism, is on his third visit to the University of Wisconsin's Weizmann Laboratory for Brain Imaging and Behavior. For the past five years, Buddhist monks with tens of thousands of hours of meditation training have volunteered their brains for scientific study. Spending time with them is very inspiring because they are always very happy, very funny also. That produces some oscillation in your brain. Neuroscientist Antoine Lutz is part of a team of researchers trying to understand how the monk's mental training changes the brain. We think that someone who is trained to uh, practice compassion, they're somehow going to change their brain through this practice. So we are interested to see how far can you transform your mind and how far that the brain can change? Seeing how physical training or experience altered brain circuits, the team at the University of Wisconsin wanted to know if mental training like meditation could change a region in the brain that manages emotions. We think that what meditation does is training this region to react differently. Uh, next, we're going to do another block of compassion meditation. On this visit to the lab, Lutz asked Mignor Rinpoche to use his powers of concentration and attention to focus on compassion, a traditional Buddhist meditation practice. This gives the scientists a glimpse into the inner workings of a brain that has been trained to enter intense emotional states. So what you see here is the EG across 20 seconds when Mingyu and Pache was just staying at rest, doing nothing in, you know, normal states. At this particular moment, we ask him to start to meditate on compassion. And what you see is that there is a very strong increase in the speed of the oscillations while he starts to meditate. What Mingyu Rinpoche's brain is doing is called gamma activity. All brains do it, but very rarely at this level. Okay, Rinpoche, that's the end of that block. The fact that the monks' brains remain in this state, even after they stop meditating, is an example of neuroplastic change. That's for us, is an indication that through the training, something happened in the brain, and something had changed in such a way that they can generate these very, very integrative and coherent states during meditation. This transformation of brain activity equals what the monks describe as a state of clarity and intense compassion for other beings. It is our hope that by collaborating with experts like Mingyu and Puche, we can maybe better understand what is consciousness in relation to the brain. There's many, many parallels between uh, the modern science and Buddhism view. What, what we... For Mingyu Rinpoche, collaborating with Lutz has shown him how his thinking, his meditation practice, actually transforms the brain. So the more you meditate, the more the amplitude increase. Oh, more, 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 more. More, yes. more time, better. Yeah. If you apply meditation every day a little bit, then you change the, the habit of the brain function. The brain uh, uh, changes in a kind of haphazard way, if you will, uh, without that kind of systematic input or training. Professor Richard Davidson is the director of the Weissman Center and the principal author of the meditation studies. We are exposed to all kinds of influences in our environment all the time 
those influences uh, are affecting our brain. They are changing our brain. If we are better able to regulate those inputs and to engage in specific kinds of training to cultivate positive qualities of mind, uh, we can, I think, based upon modern neuroscience evidence, we can change our brains by transforming our minds in beneficial ways. Davidson has published dozens of neuroscientific studies on emotional disorders and brain structure, but it was his personal interest in meditation that made him pursue a new line of research. The brain is constantly changing. It's changing all the time. Uh, and the question is, how can we change it for the better? To find out how emotions might be managed using the brain's plasticity, Davidson turned to one of the world's experts on training the mind. His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. The monks who come to Davidson's lab are willing to spend hours in the tubes of the giant fMRI machines at the direct request of the Dalai Lama himself. He encourages the monks, the lamas, the other Buddhist scholars around him to volunteer their brains for this neuroscience research. And specifically, what he's interested in learning is whether mental training, which in Buddhism, of course, takes the form of meditation, can act back on the brain to produce structural and functional changes. Can it? He believes it does. Buddhist philosophy says it does. And the emerging research indeed shows that it can. Pulling together what she found in Dharamsala and decades of brain science research, Begley wrote the book on the new discovery that our minds, our thinking, can change our brains. Your book is titled Train Your Mind, Change Your Brain. Is that really possible? I think it is possible. And by training your mind, what I mean is if you choose to engage in meditation, then the research emanating from Richie Davidson's lab at Wisconsin does show that you can achieve things such as, for instance, switching activity in the region just behind your forehead. Meditation can indeed cause that shift. It can cause you to shift activity toward the left side, which again, correlated with contentment. Very good? Yeah. Oh, you like it? The brain mechanisms that are associated with happiness are themselves changeable. They are among the most plastic circuits in the brain that are transformable through experience. <laughs> with evidence that meditation was changing the circuits in the part of the brain associated with contentment and happiness in monks, Davidson extended his research to people who had only a brief eight-week training in a form of meditation designed to decrease negative emotions and cultivate the positive. People like you and I, uh, ordinary middle-class Americans, underwent this training. Uh, they showed a reliable change in their brain activity over the course of this two-month period. It is more scientific evidence that, Davidson says, holds out the promise that the powers of neuroplasticity could mean, as the old saying goes, that we can be as happy as we make up our minds to be. We shouldn't think of these as fixed characteristics of people. If we take the initiative, if we take responsibility for our own minds, we can produce more positive individuals who have more of these beneficial qualities, which in turn, I think, will have a synergistic effect in making our culture uh, and our society a more positive one.